Thank you so much. Can you hear me in the back? Good. You know the story of the priest who uh, gets up and he's having trouble with the microphone and he's saying, is this on? And he's banging on it and finally he says, I think there's something wrong with this thing. And the crowd yells out, and also with you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am so happy to be here. Um, it's just, it's wonderful to be here. I just want to say that. And I, I want to start off with uh, what I think is a, a very moving and a very touching story uh, about three different vocations. Um, and it's the story of a Franciscan friar, uh, a Dominican nun, and a Jesuit priest um, who are driving to Louisville um, and get into, a, get into a, an argument about how to pronounce Louisville. Um, and they get so uh, worked up that they drive off the road and bang, they hit a telephone pole and they go straight to heaven. And St. Peter comes out and he sees the, the friar, the Dominican nun, and the Jesuit priest and he says, well, you know, welcome to heaven, he says, but uh, I got to tell you, I'm going to bring you into God's throne room uh, and God is going to ask you one question and that question is going to determine whether or not you get into heaven. So, you know, they're all pretty nervous, but uh, they're, they're coming up with their, uh, their ideas about what they're going to say. And um, they get brought into this throne room, which is spectacular. It has gold walls and a silver floor and the ceiling is open to the sky. And there on this colossal throne made of solid gold with diamonds is God. And, uh, you know, they're all sort of quaking in their boots and God leans down to the Franciscan friar and says from his great throne, son of St. Francis, what do you believe? And the friar says, I believe in you, Lord, and I believe in your son, Jesus, who came to work with the poor, which is why I spent all of my life working with the poor. I also believe that I need to be forgiven for my sins. And God says, excellent answer, welcome to heaven. And then he turns to the Dominican nun and he says from his great throne, daughter of St. Dominic, what do you believe? And of course the Dominican sister says, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only son of God, eternally be, and God says, okay, that's fine. <laughs> welcome to heaven. And he turns to the Jesuit from his great gold jewel encrusted throne and he says, son of St. Ignatius, what do you believe? And the Jesuit says, I believe you're in my seat. <laughs> and that's a true story. I'd like to tell you another very moving story about vocations. Uh, it's the story of a barber in a small town and he, um, he comes into his, his shop one day and there's a guy uh, waiting for him in a, a brown robe and sandals and um, the barber says, why are you dressed like that? And he says, I'm a Franciscan, I work in a soup kitchen in town and the barber says, oh, the Franciscans, who doesn't love the Franciscans? All the wonderful work you do for peace and for the environment, this haircut is free. So the Franciscan thanks him and leaves. He's very happy for the free haircut. And the next day the barber comes and there's a surprise on his doorstep. There's a big wicker basket filled with wildflowers with a thank you note from the Franciscan. And that day he comes in uh, and there's a guy wearing a long white robe with a black scapular and a leather belt. And he says, why are you dressed like that? And he said, I'm a Trappist. And he said, oh, the Trappist. He said, I love Thomas Merton and you guys are so wonderful. You're, you pray for us all day. This haircut's free. And the Trappist thanks him and leaves. And the next day, the barber comes, and on his doorstep, there's a surprise waiting for him. A big wicker basket filled with Trappist cheeses and jams from Gethsemane with a thank you note. So then uh, the barber comes, and that day he goes in, and there's a guy wearing a black suit with a, a clerical collar. And uh, he sits down and says, how come you dress like that? And he said, I'm a Jesuit. He says, oh, my gosh. He said, you know, uh, my daughter went to Georgetown and my son goes to BC. This haircut's for free. So the Jesuit thanks him, leaves, and the next day the barber comes, and on his doorstep there's a surprise waiting for him. Ten more Jesuits. <laughs> Which is also a true story. Now, Imagine if I told you a third joke or a fourth joke, you might start to feel a little uncomfortable. You might start to wonder when I was going to get to the point. 
You might wonder whether so many jokes were appropriate in such a setting. It's funny, haha, -ha, but it's sort of beside the point. But God bless you. Um, <laughs> but in a way, those stories are the point of my talk, which is that joy, humor, and laughter are underappreciated values in the spiritual life and are desperately needed not only in our own personal spiritual lives, but in the life of the church and especially in vocations work. Joy is not a waste of time, far from it, for joy is what we will be sharing when we're welcomed into heaven. We will be joyful, I hope we're joyful, we may even laugh for joy. Humor is an essential but neglected requirement of Christian spirituality and a very essential element of vocation work for anyone who's in vocations, which of course is everyone in any religious order. Billy Joel, I think, was wrong when he sang a few decades ago, I'd rather laugh with the sinners and cry with the saints. Well, Billy Joel had it backwards. You laugh with the saints. The most joyful people are those who are closest to God. Joy, humor, and laughter are necessary, healthy, and have a long tradition, one that we ignore at our peril in the church. They are needed both for those who work in vocation to keep a sense of humor about the church, about the difficulties in vocation work, and more importantly, to show that Christian joy, I think, is the best way to attract others to Christ. Joy has a somewhat disreputable reputation in the Catholic Church. And that's a tragedy not only because it's necessary in our spiritual lives, but it also has a distinguished history among the saints and the spiritual masters as an essential element for healthy spirituality. When you meet someone in touch with God, are they, are they not truly joyful? Think of the holy people that you've known in your orders. Were they not full of joy, the spirit of the resurrection? Think how easy it is to think of someone like Francis of Assisi smiling, okay? Maybe not Ignatius so much, he looks a little more dour. <laughs> now before we go any further, I wanna say that I'm not advocating a mindless idiotic happiness. As the book of Ecclesiastes says, there is a time to weep and a time to mourn. You would be a robot if you weren't sad during times of misfortune or illness or death or over some of the recent developments in the church such as the sexual abuse crisis. Those are things to mourn and to grieve. But Ecclesiastes also said there is a time to laugh. And sometimes laughter, even in the midst of sadness, can be healthy. A few years ago, the superior of the Jesuit province in New York was visiting the province infirmary. And uh, the provincial was telling all the older men uh, how the province was doing and how it was getting older and older and older. Uh, you know, the average age, uh, in, I think, in my Jesuit province is 107. Um, <laughs> and so the provincial said to the men, we have so many elderly Jesuits that we really have no place to put them. There isn't even room for anyone in the infirmary, to which one elderly Jesuit stood up and shouted out, Father Provincial, we're dying as fast as we can. <laughs> Now that is a true story. <laughs> it's not clear to what extent joy, humor, and laughter has, have been deemed as inappropriate in Catholic history, but I'm sure uh, we've all met Catholics who think that being religious means being deadly serious all the time. But you know, I always say if you're deadly serious, you're probably seriously dead as well. <laughs> and I'm sure you all know priests, no one here of course, uh, who makes you wonder how they can celebrate Mass when they never crack a smile. I'm sure you've been to masses where the priest says, and we join with the choirs of angels in their unending hymn of praise, holy, holy, holy Lord. And I always think, man, if that's the way the angels are praising God, we're in big trouble. The other day in my Jesuit community, a lovely guy stood up and he said, it was the, the, the gospel, um, the verse before, and he said, alleluia. <laughs> Wow, Christ is risen. <laughs> now, I have a few theories about why humor may not be as valued as it should be, and that started early. First of all, it's worth thinking how much the gospel writers were interested in presenting Jesus as an overtly humorous person. While the gospels clearly show Jesus as clever, especially when it comes to the parables, 
There are a few moments in the whole New Testament that strike one as laugh out loud funny. Why might that be? Well, recently I asked some distinguished New Testament scholars what they thought about Jesus and humor. Wouldn't it make sense that if the evangelists wanted to present Jesus as an appealing figure, they would highlight at least some humor? After all, humor is something that people found appealing, and they did back in antiquity in the time of Jesus. In any event, some scholars suggested that it was a reflection of the Jewish culture at the time, which took religion seriously. God was not something to be laughed about. Religion was serious. Another scholar, Professor Amy Jill Levine, uh, who wrote a book called The Misunderstood Jew about Jesus, uh, said that one, uh, one thing is that what we think is funny is not what the people in New Testament times would have thought uh, would have been funny. For them, the setup was more amusing. Uh, Professor Levine said, the parables were amusing in their exaggeration or hyperbole. The idea that a mustard seed would have sprouted into a big bush that birds would build their nests in is actually funny. It's not just clever. Another reason that humor might have been downplayed in the Gospels was the prevailing Hellenistic culture into which the Gospel was first introduced. Greek culture, as you know, was very interested in reason, and of course reason is very serious. For Aristotle, the highest ideal was thought. And what was the highest activity? Thinking. I learned this at Loyola Chicago in philosophy. <laughs> so for Aristotle, what was the best image of God that he could come up with? It was thought thinking about thought, which you know, sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> also, Roman culture during the first century laid emphasis on two character traits for leaders, gravitas, which is a kind of seriousness that marks a leader, and pietas, a, a, duty, a sort of duty towards one country. Both gravitas and pietas were serious virtues. Finally, another scripture scholar suggested that joy and enthusiasm could lead to, uh-oh, erotic love, which was seen as dangerous and suspect. The church fathers frequently wrote against humor. St. Paul, for example, writes in his letter to Ephesians that we must avoid, quote, smartness in talk. St. Clement of Alexandria warned against humorous and unbecoming words. I think that's one category, not two, for him. And St. Ambrose avoided, joking should be avoided even in small talk. So another barrel of laughs, St. Ambrose. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, St. Augustine recommends some joking from time to time, and Aquinas recommends play in his writings, saying that there's a virtue in playfulness because it leads to relaxation. So those are a few reasons why humor might have been given short shrift in Christian circles. Jewish culture, Greek culture, Roman culture, a lack of understanding of what was considered funny and what we consider funny as being different, uh, as well as an over-familiarity with the story. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now you might agree with that little analysis. That's okay. I'm not Donald Sr. I'm not a scripture scholar. The point is not to prove conclusively that the church has undervalued humor in the past, but that we need to value it today. I would suggest that humor is not prized as much as it should be in the church, at least on an official level. Now, you might know a funny priest, or a humorous nun, or a jokey pastoral associate, but how many newly appointed bishops have you heard as officially described as funny? <laughs> now, we all laugh. Why do we laugh at that? Because it just seems strange to us. When was the last time you heard the bishop described by the Vatican as this? The new bishop is completely hilarious and has an amazing sense of humor and laughs all the time. <laughs> humor is sometimes seen as a strike against a church leader when it should be considered as a requirement. That's not to say that no bishop has a sense of humor or no church leader or no provincial. Cardinal John O'Connor of New York was once at a fundraising dinner and a friend of his got up, the MC, and proceeded to thank everyone at the end of the meal. And unfortunately, he had a bad name, memory, so every time he forgot, he would put out a little card and read the name. So he'd say, I would very much like to thank Brother Paul for his wonderful work. I'd also like to thank Brother Peter for his wonderful work. I'd like to thank uh, Sister Charlene for her work. I'd also like to thank uh, Ms. Tui for all of her 
wonderful work uh, on behalf of the committee. Now I'd like to call up Cardinal O'Connor who will give us his final benediction. And Cardinal O'Connor got up there and he said, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, loving God, we thank you for all the blessings you've given us tonight. We thank you for the many things you've given us and we ask this in the name of your Son, <laughs> Jesus Christ. But some Catholic, that, this is holy water, by the way, that uh, helps me. But some Catholic leaders seem tone deaf to the need for humor and the ability to laugh at oneself. Uh, Chicago's Cardinal Cody was speaking to a group of priests once and extolling the virtue of prayer, and he actually said, prayer is the most important part of my spiritual life. This is a paraphrase. Uh, and it's especially important in the life of the priest. I myself believe that prayer is the engine of my spiritual life because it leads to humility as a matter of fact, the other day I was in front of the Blessed Sacrament and I heard uh, Jesus say to me, Your Eminence. <laughs> the undervaluing of humor. Yes, and God calls me Father when we pray. Uh, the undervaluing of humor is all the more surprising when we look at the Gospels and we see a Jesus who had a real sense of joy and even playfulness which you can see in many of the parables. And there are under other indications that he must have been someone who was joyful. You'll remember at one point in the Gospels, Jesus is castigating for not being serious enough, right? They say, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, says Jesus, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard. He's being critiqued for not being serious. Jesus himself embraces people with a sense of humor and even sarcasm. You'll remember the story of Nathaniel, sitting under the fig tree when he's told that the Messiah is passing by and his friends say the Messiah is from Nazareth and Nathaniel says can anything good come from Nazareth which is a joke about how backwards the city was and you know it's like saying can anything good come from Louisville right I mean that gets a few laughs but we're so familiar with those stories we might miss the humor but what's interesting is that does not bother Jesus one bit what does he say to that he doesn't say Make not fun of the poor people of Nazareth. <laughs> you know, which is what, it's like a Joanine response. Um, <laughs> Jesus says, now there's an Israelite without deceit. Jesus says, that's great. And then he invites him to join him. So he invites this guy that's just made a sarcastic remark about his hometown to join him. I, was, I think Nathaniel's like the first New Yorker disciple. Um, <laughs> And there are many signs from the evangelists themselves, that is from the way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the stories uh, that show some humor, but again, we might be so familiar with them that we miss them. Uh, the story of Zacchaeus, uh, the little man who climbs up into the tree to get a better look at Jesus, is very touching, but it's also a playful story as written by Luke. You know, um, if you think about it, Zacchaeus, what my, one of my scripture professors said at the time, they're wearing these short tunics, so you know, when Zacchaeus is up in the tree, they know everything about Zacchaeus. Um, and then there's the story of Eutychus, which doubtless you know, I had no idea until I looked this up, is in Acts 20. Uh, Eutychus is sitting in the window ledge of a room in which St. Paul is speaking. And uh, St. Paul is talking and talking and talking and talking until about midnight. Eutychus falls asleep, falls out the window, drops to the ground, is presumed dead, until Paul goes down, finds out he's not dead, and then brings him back up to the room where he talks until dawn. So, you know, but when we hear that at church, all we say is, thanks be to God. Um, but you know, while some church fathers and some quarters in the church may have downplayed the role of uh, humor in Christian life, the saints never did. Most of the saints were joyful. While I was researching my book, My Life with the Saints, which makes the perfect gift for any candidate, aspirant, postulant, <laughs> novice, person in formation, in active or contemplative orders, as well as a good gift for ordinary time, Lent, <laughs> Easter, Christmas, and Septuagesima Sunday, and which will be available outside at a discount, I realized one thing. <laughs> 
The saints were deeply attractive people who people wanted to be around. And in general, the people that we find attractive usually have a sense of humor, don't they? Joy, humor, and laughter are constant threads through the lives of the saints, disproving that stereotype of the dour, grumpy, depressed saint. You laugh with the saints. St. Teresa of Avila herself even spoke out against that kind of deadly serious Catholicism. Now here is a quote, and if you have a problem with it, take it up with the doctor of the church. Quote, a sad nun is a bad nun. <laughs> quote, I am more afraid of one unhappy sister than a crowd of evil spirits. What would happen if we hid what little sense of humor we already had? Let each of us use this humbly to cheer one another." End quote. Stories about the humor of the saints reach as far back as the early Roman martyrs. In the third century, St. Lawrence, who was burned to death over a gridiron, famously called out to his executioners, turn me over, I'm done on this side. Or remember St. Augustine of Hippo, who famously prayed, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. I know many people who still pray that prayer. <laughs> and some saints were known specifically for their sense of humor. St. Philip Neri, for example, you probably know was called the humorous saint. And at his door was a little sign that said the, joy, the house of Christian mirth. Isn't that beautiful? Christian joy is a gift from God flowing from a good conscience. Once a, a priest asked St. Philip, well he wasn't St. Philip then, the priest didn't go up and say, oh St. Philip, let me ask you a question. <laughs> I always like the idea of the saints writing to each other, you know, like, Dear St. Ignatius, how are you? I'm fine. Your friend St. Philip Neri. Um, <laughs> how do you like the stained glass windows of you? Um, I think they make you look old. Um, once a priest asked Philip Neri what prayer would be most appropriate to say for a couple after a wedding mass, and Philip Neri thought and said, A prayer for peace. <laughs> Saintly humor continues until modern times. The most well-known contemporary example, I think, is Blessed Pope John the who Twenty-Third, most, whose most famous joke when a journalist innocently asked him, Your Holiness, how many people work in the Vatican? And he said, about half of them. <laughs> Another time someone said, Your Holiness, I understand the Vatican is closed in the afternoon, as it is in Italy, and people don't work. And John the Twenty-Third said, no, no. He said, it's closed in the afternoon, people don't work in, in the morning. <laughs> Which, of course, is no longer true. <laughs> Another time, uh, John was walking around the streets of Rome and someone said, oh my God, he's so fat. And uh, John turned around and said, Madam, I trust you understand the papal conclave is not exactly a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> in the early 1940s, when John was still a cardinal and the nuncio in Paris, he was in el at an elegant dinner party, and he was seated across from a woman wearing a very low-cut dress that exposed a lot of cleavage, and his secretary turned to him and said, Eminenza, aren't you embarrassed at such a scandal? And John said, why? And he said, everyone is looking at that woman with that cleavage. And John said, no one is looking at that woman. Everyone is looking at me to see if I am looking at that woman. <laughs> but you know, my favorite John story is, uh, has him in a hospital in Rome called the Hospital of the Holy Spirit, uh, run by a group of sisters called the Sisters of the Holy Spirit. They were very clever when they named the hospital. And, <laughs> So uh, John was visiting the hospital. Apparently he had a lot of time to walk around the streets back then to have people call him fat and visit hospitals. And he was visiting the hospital and he went in and the sister in charge was so excited she ran up to him and she said, Your Holiness, welcome. I am the superior of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and he said, Well now you outrank me. I'm only the Vicar of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> now, the saints knew that there were some good reasons for humor. 
Humor serves some serious purposes in our lives and in the life of the Christian and the life of the church. So let's look at 10 reasons for joy, humor, and laughter in the church. Number one, humor evangelizes. Joy, humor, and laughter show one's joy in the risen Christ and one's faith in God. This positive outlook shows people that you believe in the resurrection. You believe in the power of life over death. You believe in the power of love over hatred. Don't you think that after the resurrection, the disciples were joyful? All will be well, all will be well, and all manner of things will be well, as Blessed Julian of Norwich said. Joy reveals faith. As St. Teresa said, why hide it? Once, when I was a Jesuit novice, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, a fellow named Peter Hans Kolvenbach, came to visit our novitiate. And as you know, we're all concerned in religious orders with declining numbers. And we were all supposed to ask Father General one question. And I wanted to come up with some dazzling question that would make him say, oh, you're the most brilliant novice I've ever met. Um, and I said, Father General, what's the best way to increase vocations? And I thought he'd say, well, we have to advertise more. We have to do more in high schools. We have to do this. He said, live your own vocation joyfully. That's good advice for anyone. Joy attracts people to Christ. Why would anyone want to join a group of miserable people? And I continually point to that as the most effective way to increase vocations, in my humble opinion. You know, many of my friends have been vo are vocation directors or have been vocation directors. It sometimes seems like all of my Jesuit friends from theology are either president of Jesuit high schools or vocation directors. And I know it's a difficult job just from listening to them. One of my friends used to always say that your whole life, your whole year is reduced to one number. How many people choose to enter? Something you have no control over. One day during a year when vocations were low, a good friend of mine, who used to be the vocation director in the Chicago province, was lamenting that fact. And he was sort of sharing with me, and he said, all anyone cares about is that one number. And I nodded sympathetically, and I said, yes, that's true. And then I paused and I said, so how many people are entering this year? <laughs> Fortunately, he has a good sense of humor. Overall, from what my friends in vocation work tell me, uh, it may be hard to figure out the best tools for attracting vocations. That's why I like to continually return to that advice from Father Kolvenbach about living your own vocation joyfully. Joy. So simple, so difficult, uh, and yet so profound. As an aside, as you know, the Superior General uh, of the Jesuits is sometimes called Father General, or more simply, the General. In the 1960s, another Father General, uh, Pedro Arupe, who also had a marvelous sense of humor, was visiting a Jesuit school in New York called Xavier High School. Uh, we're pretty clever at naming our schools, too. Um, There's about 80 Loyola high schools. Uh, at the time, all the boys in the school uh, wore military uniforms and had drills and had guns and things like that. I don't think they were loaded. Um, but in New York, you never know. So when it was announced that Father General was coming to visit Xavier High School, uh, the school decided that all the students would line the street, line 16th Street in New York, uh, wearing their uniforms as a way of giving Father General a real welcome. So a friend of mine was accompanying Father General, and he said that the General's car drove down the street between all these guys, these kids in uniform, and he opened the door, and suddenly, suddenly, everyone snapped to attention. And Father Rupe got out and said to my friend, now I am a real General. <laughs> Number two, humor is a good tool for humility. We can tell jokes about ourselves to deflate our egos, which is a good thing, especially for anyone working in an official capacity in the church, where it's easy, believe it or not, to get puffed up. That goes for cardinals who wear silk robes and have people kissing their rings. That goes for priests, brothers and sisters, whom others think are holy just because they're in a religious order. Well, of course, we're holy, but other people are not. That goes for lay people in parishes and schools and hospitals and chanceries who exercise a great deal of power over people's spiritual lives. All of us, including myself, can get puffed up. And humor is a great way for people to remind themselves of their essential humanity, their essential poverty of spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For example, that Jesuit joke I told at the beginning, those two Jesuit jokes are fun to tell. I love the Society of Jesus. But jokes remind me that Jesuits need to be careful about being too proud about their accomplishments or too focused on too many practical matters. That's usually the, the punchline for these Jesuit jokes. You know the story of the three priests, the Franciscan, the Dominican, and the Jesuit, who are on a retreat together. Do you know this? And they receive this special grace 
of finding themselves physically present at the nativity scene. So they're kneeling before the nativity scene and the Dominican priest says to Mary, oh, the joy of seeing the word made flesh, of seeing the incarnation of God, of witnessing the hypostatic union of the human and the divine, and seeing the logos made present. And the Franciscan says to Jesus, oh, the joy of seeing how the Son of God identifies with the poor and chooses to be born in poverty among the dear animals that God loved so much and created. And the Jesuit says to St. Joseph, have you considered a Jesuit high school for the kid? <laughs> Humor deflates our puffed up egos, and it reminds us not to take ourselves with such deadly seriousness. That goes for people at the very top, too. Once when Pope John XXIII was in Rome, he got a letter from a little boy named Bruno. Dear Pope, wrote Bruno, I am undecided. I don't know if I want to be a policeman or a pope. What do you think? My dear Bruno, wrote the Pope, but once again, the Popes had a lot more free time back then. Uh, if you want my opinion, learn to be a policeman, for that cannot be improvised. As for becoming Pope, anybody can be the Pope. The proof is that I have become one. If you're ever in Rome, please stop by and I will be glad to talk all this over with you. That's an important way the saints used humor, as a tool in their quest for humility. In the 1960s, you remember the Red Brigade was causing violence in Rome, and people would carry, while he was still alive, pictures of Padre Pio for protection against that. And one day, Padre Pio was going into Rome, and one of his brothers said to him, aren't you afraid of going into Rome? And he said, no, I have a picture of Padre Pio with me. <laughs> <laughs> Humor also, number three, humor shocks listeners into recognizing reality. In other words, humor gets right to the point. It puts things into perspective. St. Francis of Assisi once said, preach the gospel, use words when necessary. That's pretty clever. It's even funny, but it's also a profound truth. St. Andrew Avellino was a 17th century canon lawyer who entered the Theatines. One day a pious priest said to him, Father Avellino, how long should one stay at the bedside of a sick person? Rather than offer a long explanation, Avellino said, be brief. There are two advantages. If they like you, they'll want you to come back. If you're boring, their displeasure will be very short. <laughs> Number four, humor speaks truth to power. A witty remark is a time-honored way to challenge the pompous, the puffed up, or the powerful. Jesus deployed humor in this way, exposing and diffusing the arrogance of religious authorities with clever parables. Humor is a weapon against the battle, in the, in the battle against the arrogance and pride that sometimes infects our church, our orders, and ourselves. A good friend of mine, a Jesuit, told me that his mother was once in the hospital at the same time the local bishop was. And the uh, bishop had just had an operation, and after the operation, the bishop went from room to room visiting all the patients. When he visited my friend's mother, who was recovering from a difficult surgery, he walked into the room, patted her on the head, and said very unctuously, my dear, I know exactly how you feel. And she said, really, when was your hysterectomy? And the bishop told that story at her funeral, which showed that he has a sense of humor. Number five, humor shows Christian courage. As I mentioned, St. Lawrence showed his courage to his torturers during his martyrdom by calling out, I'm done on this side. It's both a pointed challenge to his executioners and a bold profession of faith. In that same vein, St. Thomas More in the 16th century, as he was stepping up to the chopping block to his beheading, said to his executioner, I pray you help me on the way up. I will take care of myself on the way down. That brand of humor says, I do not fear God. I, excuse me, I do not fear death. I believe in God. Number six, humor deepens our relationship with God. One of the best ways of thinking about prayer, as you know, is as a personal relationship. Like any relationship, our relationship with God often starts with infatuation. It goes through exciting times and dry times. It requires time, it requires listening, it requires some moments of silence, and it requires honesty. 
All of the things you can say about friendship, this is uh, Father Bill Barry's great insight in his books, all the things you can say about friendship, you can say about prayer. And when you're thinking about your prayer, if you say to yourself, you know, is this the way I would be with a friend? Some people say, well, God's the most important thing in my life, but I don't have time. So you would say to the person, well, you know, um, is that how you would treat a friend? Are you really a good friend if you don't spend time with, with that friend? So it's a great analogy. Our relationship with God, like any relationship, could also use some humor. That is, it's okay to be playful with God in prayer and accept that God might want to be playful with you. Once when she was traveling to one of her convents, Teresa of Avila was knocked off her donkey, fell into the mud, and said to God, Lord, you couldn't have picked a worse time for this to happen. Why would you let this happen? And the response she heard in prayer was, that's how I treat my friends. And Teresa said, and that's why you have so few of them. <laughs> that's a playful way of addressing God. And you know, that assumes God's playfulness with us. Here's a question. Can you allow God in your personal lives to be playful with you? The book of Isaiah says, the Lord takes delight in you. My, one of my spiritual directors used to say it all the time, the Lord takes delight in you. Can you allow God to take delight in you, to be playful with you? On a practical level, that means this. Can you imagine God not simply loving you? How many times have you heard that? God loves you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but as the British theologian James Allison says, can you imagine God liking you? God likes you. That's a totally different energy, isn't it? Can you allow God to give you things that delight you and give you joy? Can you allow yourself to think that the wonderful or funny or unexpected things that surprise you are signs of God being playful with you? If you think about the metaphor of God as a parent, which limps sometime for people, that's not always the best metaphor, but if you think about that metaphor, you could say, does not a parent sometimes enjoy being playful with a child? For myself, I like to think that those surprising moments in life that make us laugh are examples of God's delight in you. The Jesuit priest Anthony DeMello may have said it best in one of his shortest recommendations for prayer. Look at God looking at you and smiling. Number seven, humor welcomes. Hospitality is an important virtue in both the Old and the New Testaments. In the New Testament, the act of welcoming Jesus, as you know, was a sign of one's acceptance of Jesus. If a town didn't welcome the disciples, Jesus said, uh, brush the dust from your shoes off your feet. That's completely, uh, as an editor, I'd probably cross that line off, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Jesus said it much more articulately. <laughs> Jesus himself welcomed those who were outsiders into the community. Jesus is always bringing in by healing them and casting out demons. He's showing God's hospitality. In the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah were rewarded for their hospitality of strangers with the gift of a son. You know, um, you know Sarah is like a thousand years old and Abraham's like a thousand and ten. And as you know, Sarah hears that she's going to have a child and she laughs. And I had to check this and God actually, God says, you laughed. And Sarah says, no, I didn't. And God actually says, quote, yes, you did. <laughs> and you know, when Sarah has a baby, they name him Yitzhak, which means he laughs. So laughter is the heart of all this. And then in the Middle Ages, the Benedictines gave us that wonderful model, hospis venit, Christus venit, the guest comes, Christ comes. You know, frequently Jesuits are not known for their hospitality very much, and we sometimes say the guest comes, Christ comes, and he is crucified. Um, <laughs> Humor is one way of showing hospitality. Perhaps the easiest way to get someone to feel at home is to make them laugh. You know that a dinner party or gathering is successful when people feel at home and they start to laugh. A few years ago, I was working in Nairobi, Kenya with refugees. And at the end of my first year, I signed up for an eight-day retreat at the Jesuit Retreat House in Nairobi, which is a, just a beautiful place and wonderful Jesuits there. The retreat house grounds are gorgeous. They're right at the foot of the Gong Hills. If you've seen Out of Africa, you know Meryl Streep says, um, I had a farm in Africa at the foot of the Gong Hills. Well, we have a retreat house at the foot of the Gong Hills. Um, anyway, on the last day of the retreat, uh, there was this big celebratory dinner, uh, and everyone was supposed to speak about their retreat. And in East Africa, at least, you know, an eight-day retreat costs a lot of money uh, for people, and so it's a big occasion uh, for people. They don't necessarily do it every year. And so they had this wonderful celebratory dinner. 
But when I um, sort of stood up and looked around at a room probably about half this size, I realized that I was the only man left. For some reason, all the priests and brothers had gone, and it was the sisters that stayed behind. I don't know what that says about sisters or priests or brothers, but it was all sisters who stayed behind to celebrate. And so I stood up, and I was in front of all these African sisters, and I felt a little strange. And as you know, if you're in a different culture, you're worried about saying the wrong thing. And I blurted out, I guess I'm the only man here. And from across the room, an African sister jumped up and shouted out, and blessed are you among women. <laughs> One of my favorite uses of scripture. Uh, the other use was uh, the um, Little Sisters of Jesus, who I worked with, this wonderful order. Uh, they had their monstrance stolen from their tiny little chapel, which was like a little garage. And uh, they stole the monstrance itself and the host, which was in there, and the sister came up to me and said, they have taken away our Lord and we do not know where they have put him. <laughs> so everyone laughed at that place and I felt right at home. Laughter and humor had welcomed me into the community. Number eight, humor is healing. Physicians, psychologists, and psychiatrists believe that humor helps the healing process in the physical body. Laughter releases endorphins. And if we take seriously the Pauline image of the body of Christ, we might consider whether or not that holds true for the Christian community as well. In the midst of some of the worst times in the church, with the sexual abuse crisis, declining vocations, and parishes closing, the people of God could use from time to time a little laughter. That's not to say that one laughs about the pain or suffering or even sin in the church. Rather, humor gives us a much needed break and can help us to heal. Number nine, humor fosters good relations and helps us with our work. Humor can be grease for the wheels in a difficult institution. This is most important for all of us who work in an official capacity in the church. In his parables, Jesus uses, Jesus uses humor as a way of helping people to understand difficult topics. Or consider a more secular example about the use of humor. In Doris Kearns Goodwin's wonderful book, Team of Rivals, about Abraham Lincoln and his uh, associates, she tells the story about how Lincoln gathered around him a very different group of men. Most of the time, they, most of the time they disagreed with one another, quarreled with one another, and even worked against one another. And one way that Abraham Lincoln lightened the atmosphere or made a point without offending anyone was to tell a little joke or a country story. Humor can make for good social relations. Once before the Second Vatican Council, John the 23rd picked up a preparatory document, held it up to uh, the, the, the sort of assembled bishops and said, look at all these condemnations. It was filled with condemnations of uh, different theologians. And he says, there's 12 centimeters here. I want to get, to, I want to get it down to six centimeters. So rather than going through this lengthy theological disquisition, he used a little humor. Number 10, humor opens our minds. Neuroscience tells us that when we laugh, we release endorphins and can relax. Psychologists say that when we relax and feel less threatened, we are more able to listen and learn. So laughter helps to get your message across. Likewise, laughter, as you know, can signal a sudden spiritual insight. Often in spiritual direction, when people finally, finally realize how foolish or sinful or selfish they have been or they have been acting, they laugh. They laugh at themselves and at how foolish they have been to turn away from God. Why do they laugh? It's funny to think about how human we are and it's joyful to know that we've been freed by God. And I'd like to tell a very brief story about that. Uh, I was giving a retreat once, nowhere near here to no one you know, and um, <laughs> Uh, a sister came in uh, and um, she said to me, the first thing she said was, I just want to tell you at the beginning of this retreat that I don't pray Ignatian contemplation, you know, where you imagine yourself in the gospel scene. And I said, okay. And she said, so don't try that with me. <laughs> and you know, you take people where they are and where God has them. And um, so I said, okay. And I said, well, how do you like to pray? And she said, well, here's how I like to pay in my retreat. I get up in the morning and I make my morning offering. I say my rosary, then I look at the readings for the day, and then I make points for the readings of the day, 
uh, and then at lunchtime I make my uh, examination of conscience and then after lunch I read the readings again then I do another rosary and then before mass uh, I do a, a little office and then I have mass and then after mass I write down what I learned from the homily and then I do my examination of conscience and I go to bed and I said okay you know if that's the way you pray that's the way you pray and um, great so um, she comes back the next day and she says um, uh, I said, well, how was your day? And she said, very good. I said, well, what, what happened in your prayer? Well, I realized that I should be doing more in my life. I should be uh, working harder at work. I should be uh, working more in my community, and I should be praying more. And, you know, I got the image of the woman bent over from the Gospels. I really felt bad for her. But I thought, well, if that's the way she prays, that's the way she prays. And she kept saying, I should do this, I should do this. It was what one of my spiritual directors called shooting all over yourself, <laughs> S-H-O-U-L-D. Um, so I said, well, okay, go out. And, um, and I said, have you ever thought, and she said, I'm not praying Ignatian contemplation, I can't. And I said, okay. So she went out and she came back the next day and she gave me her list of shoulds. And I finally said to her, sister, um, I said, uh, why, why is it that you don't like to pray Ignatian contemplation? I'm not gonna force you. Now this goes to sort of humor and laughter as revealing. And she said, well, my spiritual director told me I have no imagination. Yeah, all is right. I mean, I felt really sorry for her and I said, you have no imagination. She said, no, I'm a very literal person and I have no imagination. And my spiritual director told me that I couldn't do that and not to try. Exactly, thank you, because that's how I felt. And I, honest to God, this came from the Holy Spirit because I'm not that clever. And I said to her, well, I had this insight, and it's, as you know, it's nice to be a fellow celibate to be able to ask this question. I said, you have no imagination. And she said, no. I said, none. She said, none. And I said, sister, have you ever once had a sexual fantasy? And she smiled. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I guess you do have an imagination. <laughs> with your imagination, sitting next to Jesus and talking to him. And she came back the next day and she said, Jesus and I talked the whole day. It was so beautiful. And you know, as an addendum to the story, I was, um, I was a retreat practicum. And I went to the, uh, my, my supervisor, you know, for this practicum uh, was an Ursuline sister. And I went to her and I told her the story and she was very happy. And I said to her as the coda, I said, you know, I said, uh, the the Jesuit, the, the spiritual director who told her this, that she didn't have an imagination, was a Jesuit. And I thought she would say, oh, isn't that crazy? And she said, she said, yeah, that just, that doesn't mean a damn thing. He said, she says, you guys are just as bad as the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> so humor deepens our understanding and it can reveal God's presence. Number 11, here's an extra reason. <laughs> humor is fun. Let me repeat that, it's fun. There may be no better reason for humor than that. God forbid that Catholics should actually enjoy themselves and have fun. Oh, what a nightmare, right? Fun, fun, a word you don't hear in church very much, fun is a foretaste of heaven. The saints understood this, and I would bet that the man whose first miracle was to turn water into wine at a wedding party understood a little about this too. Those are some reasons that joy, humor, and laughter should be part of everyone's spiritual lives, whatever your role is in the church. They are gifts from God to help us enjoy creation and build up the kingdom. They are also neglected gifts that need to be recovered for the health of the body of Christ. In short, joy, humor, and laughter are part of the vocation of being Christian. Finally, they are essential elements in attracting anyone to any kind of Christian vocation. To that end, I will end with two jokes about vocations in the church. Why? Well, by now you know the better question is why not? Now this one's a complicated one and you can fit in any of your vocations into this, uh, into this joke. And I'm very proud of this joke because of the number of vocations that it includes. <laughs> so there's this retreat. And on the retreat are a Benedictine priest, a Dominican priest, a Franciscan priest, a diocesan priest, and a Jesuit. And they're all supposed to share the, during the retreat. They're supposed to get together and share every night, but they don't know one another. So they decide as a way of um, 
building trust and uh, building confidence that what they'll do at the beginning of their retreat in order to help them share is they will tell their worst sin to the group in confidence such that after that everything will be easy. So they all say, well, that's a good way to build trust and, and we'll just, you know, break down barriers right away. So the Dominican priest stands up at this little table and he says, well, my brothers, he says, I am very, very embarrassed. He says, I hate to tell you this, he said, but I have a little problem with the profession of faith. And they say, what part? And he says, well, I don't want to tell you, but there's one part of the profession of faith that I don't believe in, even though I say it every Sunday. And I teach theology, and I'm just mortified to say that. And he sits down and he said, but I'm happy we're able to say this in confidence. So the Benedictine gets up, and they look at him, and he says, my brothers, he says, I hate to tell you this, he says, but I really don't like to celebrate Mass very much. And he says, I know that's really heretical, but I, I, just, I just don't. I like to go to Mass, but I don't like to celebrate it. So he's very embarrassed, and he sits down. And then the Franciscan stands up, and he says, my sin is much worse than all of yours. He says, my sin is that when people give me Mass stipends, I actually put them in my pocket, and I have a really nice collection of CDs that I can't do without. I'm so embarrassed, but I, I like the fact that we're being open, and I like the fact that this is in confidence. And then the diocesan priest gets up, and he says, you know, brothers, he said, my sin is worst of all. I just don't like to visit people in the hospital. It kind of grosses me out, and so I send my curate to go, and I'm kind of embarrassed by all that, but I'm happy we're able to speak in confidence. So the Jesuit's sitting there, and the Dominican looks at him and he says, Father. And the Jesuit stands up and says, Brothers, I am covered in shame. He says, My sin is worst of all. He said, I just can't keep a secret. <laughs> So now my last joke. Um, so a Jesuit priest and a Franciscan friar um, are driving to a Catholic college. And they're talking about liberation theology. And they get into this huge argument. And they swerve off the road and hit a telephone pole and go to heaven. You know, I told my sister these jokes. And she said, I'm never getting into the car with any religious anymore. <laughs> so the Jesuit and the Franciscan suddenly find themselves standing in front of the gates of heaven uh, which are hidden behind these huge puffy clouds which is what I learned at Weston Jesuit School of Theology um, and that was in the THM program and so they're all excited and they're thinking well you know we serve our lives uh, we spend our lives serving the church and all that and you know we're pretty excited we lived all those vows and I, we worked our butts off so we're pretty excited to see what heaven is like so anyway in a few minutes the clouds part, the golden gates of heaven open, the trumpets sound, and hundreds of angels start flying around singing. And then a long red carpet rolls out all the way up to the foot of the Jesuit. And out come all these Jesuit saints, many of whom you can read about in my book, My Life with the Saints, <laughs> which is on sale after the talk. Out come all these Jesuit saints on the red carpet. Aloysius Gonzaga, Francis Xavier, Robert Bellarmine, Rene Goupil. And they all greet the Jesuit who's just amazed to greet all these people that he's read about and that he's idolized. And then comes St. Ignatius Loyola himself. And St. Ignatius comes up and the Jesuit's just so overjoyed because he's, he's worked his whole life and he loves St. Ignatius. And St. Ignatius gives him a hug and says, thank you for being a good Jesuit. And the Jesuit is just overjoyed. And then a long powder blue carpet rolls out and out comes the Blessed Mother, who's dressed in blue, which is what she wears for special occasions, um, with the yellow roses on her feet. And the Blessed Mother comes out and they're all just amazed. And all the Jesuits, including St. Ignatius, kneels down and says the Hail Mary. But Mary doesn't say that because that's kind of uncomfortable for her. Um, so she's just present to them. Um, and, and then Mary hugs the Jesuit and says, thank you for being a good Catholic. And of course, the Jesuit is just overjoyed. And then a long white carpet rolls out. There's this big trumpet blast, and out comes Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ walks up, and everyone falls to their knees, except the Blessed Mother, of course. 
Um, and Jesus says to the Jesuit, thank you for your life and welcome to heaven, and thank you for being a good Christian. And of course, the Jesuit is crying now, and all the Jesuit saints are crying. And they all stand up, and they all start singing. They start singing St. Louis Jesuit songs. Um, <laughs> which is what they sing in heaven, except for Be Not Afraid. They don't sing Be Not Afraid in heaven. <laughs> and... <laughs> They, they sing City of God, that's what they sing. <laughs> and it's inclusive, too. Um, <laughs> so, so the white carpet rolls up, and the powder blue carpet rolls up, and the red carpet rolls up, and the golden gates to heaven close, and the clouds come back, and the angels are go away, and the Franciscan priest is left standing there. And so he's pretty excited. And he's thinking, hey, this is kind of exciting. So he starts wondering who's going to greet him. Which saint? Oh, maybe it'll be Bonaventure. I love Bonaventure. Or maybe St. Clair. And what will I say to St. Clair? And I bet Francis of Assisi himself will come out. And then, oh my gosh, what will I say to the Blessed Mother? And I, 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 I don't know if I can even compose myself in front of Jesus and so he's waiting and he's so excited and he's waiting and um, he waits some more and he's waiting and he looks at his watch and even though there's no time in heaven theologically um, he sees that uh, an hour has passed and he's reminding himself to be patient because he's in heaven and he's waiting and then it's two hours and he's starting to get a little pissed off. And so finally, after three hours, he's standing there in front of these clouds, and a little side door opens up, and this little Franciscan saint in a Franciscan habit with a halo, who he doesn't even know because there's so many Franciscan saints, <laughs> says, hey. And the Franciscan says, me? And he goes, yeah, come here. And so the Franciscan goes up, and the little saint says, um, um, yeah, uh, well, welcome. And the Franciscan says, excuse me, he says, is that it? <laughs> and the little saint says, what do you mean? He goes, oh, come on. He says, I spend my whole life living my vows and being a good Franciscan and helping the poor. And besides, he says, the Jesuit gets... The, 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 the red carpet and the Jesuit saints and, and his founder and then the Blessed Mother and then Jesus Christ and all I get is this? And the little saint says, oh, right, right, right. He says, well, you have to understand something. He says, we get Franciscans up here every day. We haven't had a Jesuit in 350 years. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>